Good morning. Pastor Oz coming here from the Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Uh, this is our first time using um, the iPad, so I'm waiting for a confirmation that I am on. Um, uh, people are watching, so I believe I'm on. Uh, so we will um, we'll get started here this morning. Uh, as we have been doing, I'm reading the psalm each morning and praying into the psalm that corresponds with the day of, of the year. Today is uh, the 138th day of the year, and I'm, I'm looking for uh, my translation here on my phone. So we're going to start with Psalm 138. I'm going to read it out of the ESV with some comments uh, from the King James, the New King James, that is. I've discovered the ESV during this lockdown, so some people will be happy with that. This is a Psalm of David. Psalm 138, verse 1. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, the councils of the gods, in the presence of the of the assembly of the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Lord, we, uh, we begin with thanksgiving. We begin with praise this morning. And Father, in the spirit of thanksgiving, in the spirit of praise, Lord, we begin to declare your word. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Lord, not only have you exalted your word, that's your written word, Father, that's scripture. Not only have you exalted your written promises, but you've exalted your name. You are faithful, Lord God. Your name means you are faithful to carry out your promises, Lord. Carry out your promises to your church in this hour. On the day I cried out to you, on the day I called to you, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. Lord, we cry out to you in this hour. Minister to our souls, Lord. Increase our strength, O oh God. Fulfill your promises. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, Lord. Not only shall the assembly of the gods, the divine ones, the angelic beings, uh, the, the heavenly council of, of God's prophets and apostles, not only will they give you thanks, but all the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. Although it looks, Lord God, as if you are in opposition to the nations, and you are in opposition to the nations in the places they are in opposition to you, Lord, yet the kings of the earth shall come to see what the church is coming to see, what the peoples of the earth is co are coming to see. For they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. We declare this day, Lord, great is your glory. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. Lord, though you are highly exalted, you look down at the broken, the oppressed, the vulnerable, Lord God, the violated, Lord God. You look down to them, but... In contrast, but the proud he knows from afar. Lord, remove pride from this nation, O oh God. Remove pride from your people, Lord. Remove pride from the peoples of the earth, Lord. Because you do not exalt those who are proud. You exalt those who are broken, O oh Lord. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger, the wrath of my enemies. Your right hand delivers me, Lord, in the midst of this trouble, Lord, in the midst of, of life needing to be preserved. Stretch out your hand against our enemies, and we will say it again, Lord. There are external enemies and there are internal enemies, Lord. The external enemies, this, this invisible virus, this pandemic that has closed the whole earth down according to your bidding, Lord God. And there are internal enemies, Lord. Mark Palladino spoke about them in the Bible study, Lord. Self-interest, Lord, that drives us and that causes us to see what we want to see and hear what we want to hear, Lord. Let your right hand deliver all of us from our enemies, internal and external. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. 
New King James says, the Lord will perfect that which pertains to me. But Lord, we can read that verse, Lord God. The Lord will perfect what pertains to me, Lord, as being what I want. No. What the Lord is going to perfect is his purpose for me, Lord. Bring your church into alignment with your purpose in this hour. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. And it is your steadfast love, your covenant faithfulness to us, O God, that defines that purpose, O God, in this hour. And it endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. We are the work of your hands. The church is the work of your hands, Father God. Your gospel is the work of your hands. Do not forsake the work of your hands in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Pastor Jan, we will turn it over to her. We're going to do uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, so everybody get, get ready what you have for communion. And when she's finished, she'll lead us in a prayer. share today about our walk with Christ and which path are you going to choose? Are you going to choose um, the one for eternal life with Jesus on earth and in eternity? So thank you Mark so much for um, Good morning. Good morning. He's, he's. Okay. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I uh, decided I, re I really felt the Lord wanted me to share Psalm 133. Um, Pastor read 138, which was the prayer, the psalm that I would normally be sharing today. But <clears throat> I want to say that um, what I would suggest about that Psalm 138 is to read it alone later, um, silently, and then read it out loud, not screaming, but just read it out loud because it's meant probably a lot of these meant to be sung and um but I did that last night and I happened to just read it silently and then I was compelled to read it out loud and I think that there's it's powerful um to know um that God really his mercy endures forever and when we look at all that he has done for us it's, it's pretty amazing all right, well, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 133. I'm going to read it first, and then I'm just going to briefly share my views. It's, it's, I'm going to be honest, it's hard to share in uh, sandwich between Mark and, and Pastor because um, they both are scholars and theologians, and I'm more of a simple girl. So here we go. Um, Psalm 133, a song of ascents of David. Behold, notice. News, how good and how pleasant it is for a brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Now, this is probably a psalm you've all heard uh, since the beginning of time. Um, we used to sing a song. Um, can't sing, so I'm not going to do it. But um, we, we, we've heard this psalm, a short psalm again, but very powerful. You could spend all afternoon, if you want, really dissecting it and seeing um, the power of God's command in this psalm. Behold, again, notice, take notice. This is um, interesting that it starts out with behold. It's not, um, 
it, it wants you to stop and think about this because this is really important how good and how pleasant it is I want to stop a minute things can be good for you and not pleasant things can be pleasant for you and not good for instance I could go it's good for me to get a root canal but it is not pleasant it is good for me to study for a test but it is not pleasant what about pleasant well going to the movies and eating the giant container of popcorn in a giant cup of pop is very pleasant at the time but it is not good for me and usually I pay for it later um, and then there's really bad things that people may partake in, like drinking. Seems pleasant at the time, but it's not good for you. Smoking. Those are pleasantries that later we may have to pay a cost for. But God says good and pleasant is when brethren dwell together in unity. So you're getting something good. And something pleasant at the same time when how when you dwell in unity now what does dwell mean well it's uh, it's being together and obviously right now our dwelling looks a little different because of the coronavirus we are in in unity we um, are actually uh, praying more to get I don't know if we're praying more but we are praying together and we um, also have this service online where some people maybe could make it on a Sunday and now they're able to so I think there's unity going on but we're not dwelling in it we're not living together which we know let's be honest I can be in unity with someone for a day but if I live with them 24 hours, seven days a week, like my husband, it's not always um, pleasant. It's not always, well, it can, be, it can be tricky sometimes. Now, we can also be in unity in different ways than actually just being together. I, I just know that um, recently, Pastor Wilson from the church in Queens um, has suffered a lot. He's lost members, you know, living in New York. They were hit really hard. And he expressed, you know, his sorrow to my husband and, and then found out that a lot of his um, congregants uh, didn't have food. And so... Uh, our church graciously gave them some money and I saw on Facebook if you are his friend they had one day a car like an SUV loaded to the guild with food for 10 families and then on another day vehicles loaded to the guild for food for 16 families and that just blessed me because I knew that we were a part of that unity movement to help people and then they showed um, What's so awesome is they showed um, in Mexico or wherever this village was, I really don't know, um, they sent donations to them. So what we ceded to them, they ceded to another place. And those poor people, when you look at how they live, their homes, their clothes, um, and they were given a bowl of food and they were smiling and it was just, um, you just wanted to reach in and give them more. And you wanted to hug them and you just wanted to bless them. So unity can look different. And we have to really adjust our thinking. What does that mean? You know, when I'm in the grocery store, well, I haven't been, but if I was, and there's a little lady behind me, would unity in the spirit mean letting her go first? Or how does that all look? Now, in this psalm, there's actually a simile. Um, it is like. What is like? Well, dwelling together is like. What is it like? It's like the precious oil upon the head 
running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of the garments. Now, the oil that they're talking about is in Crisco oil, which makes me think of, and a lot of you will remember, when we did an outreach in the Convey of uh, Hope, we're there with their huge trucks. We were at the, um, the, the state fairgrounds, and uh, it was an awful day. It was raining. It was muddy. It was awful. But the event continued, and there was food being given out and different services, and one was the prayer tent, and I was assigned there. And don't know why, but I was in there, and the leader was this woman named Jean. And Jean was a heavy-duty prayer warrior. I mean, um, I think she she made our hair stand on end by her strength and her prayers. Well, she had a huge, huge bottle of Crisco. I mean, I don't know where she even found it. And she was tipping that, throwing that Crisco oil everywhere as she was praying and a lot of us were just ducking so we didn't get saturated by the Crisco oil. But anyway, that's now what was put on Aaron's head. It was an anointing oil and it was made up of four different um, spices, different oils. And one was myrrh and that showed purification and protection. Now, I don't have the recipe here. They're not all equal. Um, you could look it up and see the ingredients and, and how they are put together, but I'm just telling you what the four were. The other one was cinnamon, which we know it has a sweet smell. It also symbolizes energy and ignites passion. This is an interesting one, cane oil. I didn't know there was such a thing. I guess there should be if you grind up cane. Um, that sweet smell is used in perfumes and cosmetics. Cassio is again for protection, has a sweet smell. And all those things are mixed with olive oil, which represents authority, glory, responsibility, and acting on God's behalf or the Holy Spirit's behalf. So when you mix that all together and you anoint Aaron with that, you're saying you're, he's a priest. You're saying that he is, he is symbolizing Jesus at this point. So many times in ancient history, people would be traveling. They'd come to your house. Maybe they were sweaty. Maybe they were dusty. Maybe you just anointed them with some oil to make them smell better and to feel them fresh, that they were uh, freshened up somewhat. But they put it on Aaron's head to symbolize the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The beard symbolizes his, his fatherhood. And so again, like God our Father. So the oil gets to the beard, symbolizing fatherhood, and then goes onto his clothes, which symbolizes that the oil covers all of him. That when we are truly in unity, we are truly in unity, we are covered by God. We are covered by the Holy Spirit. We There's no separation within us from God. The other simile, it says, what? Dwelling in unity is like what? It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Now, one thing I forgot to mention about um, the oil is that notice it's running down. It's not running up. The oil comes from above. Our blessings come from above. Our anointing comes from above. It does not come from within us and up. It doesn't. So when you pray and you're praying um, for strength, when you're praying for wisdom, whatever you're praying for, you're looking to Jesus. You're looking up. And he will anoint you in different times for different things. When I watched Steve Fado yesterday, there was no doubt in my mind he was under the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. And he knew that was coming down. Now it says it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Again, we have that, that imagery of dew coming down. Now, Hermon, and again, I didn't 
I'm not an expert, but it was a, a taller mountain than Zion. So it makes sense that what it had would come down. It wouldn't go up. And so the dew was coming down off that mountain to cover Zion and cover itself. And we know that dew represents freshness. It represents um, life. It represents refreshment. You know, if things were dry, if the ground was dry, the dew refreshes it with water. And so God is always looking to refresh us. He's always looking to impart to us life. So again, we have this imagery of the oil covering, and now we have the dew covering. And so when you dwell in unity with your brethren, you are covered, totally covered by God. You are totally being blessed by God and anointed by God. So this is like a two-way street. You know, many times we want to be anointed. We want to be out there doing whatever we think God wants us to do. But we're not in unity with one another. And God says in the last line, For there the Lord commands, commanded the blessing, life forevermore. He commanded this. So, in other words, if you want, if you want the perks, if you want the anointing, you have to follow the rules. You have to be in unity with your brethren because the Lord says it is good and pleasant. Um, and again, you know what? Um, always remembering that when we saw Jesus walking on earth, he was always in unity with the Father. He was always, 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 and whatever he did came from above. It always came from above. So we need to look for that. So this is a challenge because really it's hard to dwell together when we're apart. I know that sounds kind of a funny statement. But it is hard to dwell together when we're in the same proximity. But it's not impossible because the Lord commanded it. And he said, when you do it, you will, you will get an anointing. You will get an anointing like you've never had before. And it will, it will smell sweet. And it will give you protection. And it will give you energy. It will give you strength. It's like, um, and you know what? Maybe that's what we need in this hour. We really need um, a booster from God. We need that anointing oil to fall on us. It's it's hard. I know it's really hard, and it's getting harder, especially for some of us seniors. And I don't mean high school seniors. It, it's getting it's getting challenging, and some of us are getting a little wiggy. I, I know yesterday in Facebook, people were making avatars, and I thought, wow, that was fun. And how crazy dumb was that? That and so many people made an avatar. It was like really crazy but um that's not all i'm doing is making avatars i want you to know but god is good and i really believe in this hour he wants us to push closer he wants us to to read the word and to um talk to him talk to him and ask him what you need to do to be in unity with the brethren so that's all I want to share today. It's a short little exhortation. Um, and I just want, we're going to participate in our community now. So whatever you have, crackers, whatever. Um, so um, we are going to then bless the bread and thank Jesus so much, Lord. We would not be here. We would not be sitting in our homes doing this right now if it if it were not for your dying on the cross for us yesterday when steve spoke about your death and how by you giving up we gained it was it 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 just made me realize how fortunate i am and all of you are to have a savior one who cared enough about us to die for us so Lord, we thank you, remember you as we partake of this meal.
in with this cup. We say again, thank you, Jesus, for your blood, your precious blood that covers us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I forgot to say good morning, or did I? I don't remember. So good morning if I didn't say good morning. And um, here is my husband who will boggle your mind. And um, I hope I said everything correctly. I hope I didn't give anything untrue. So we're, we're trying this out. This is new for us. And um, amen. Have a blessed day. The iPad is new for us, and uh, hopefully um, we made some adjustments from the time when I opened uh, to Jan's sharing. What I want to start out with, we are going to look at part five of the series we've been teaching here on Mountain Moving Faith momentarily, but I want to read um, a Facebook posting that I received from Pastor Tyler Lind. He is the lead brother at Trinity Community Chapel in Knoxville, Tennessee. I sent this uh, posting out uh, to the members of my congregation and I believe it's, it's worth reading. We have a lot of things going on right now. Uh, and his posting was one Christ follower's thoughts on conspiracy theories. We have all kind of conspiracy theories going on right now. Uh, the main conspiracy theory that I would like to deal with is the conspiracy theory behind conspiracy theories. Um, this whole, we're, we're, we're coming into a season, you, you can see it right now, uh, the existing division in our country uh, is uh, being exacerbated by the pandemic to lock down, to open the economy, that, and it's, it's taking on all kind of political dimensions. And all I would say to that is make sure that we're paying more attention to the Word of God than self-interest. Mark Palladino spoke a tremendous word. If you did not hear the adult Sunday school Bible study that Mark Palladino did this morning, please listen to it. His, his point was about how if we are driven by self-interest, we're going to be blinded from what Jesus is saying. And I, I, I'm in total agreement with that. He went from Daniel 2 to Matthew 13 to Mark 4, and he taught it in about 30 to 35 minutes. I taught from Daniel 2 to Matthew 13 to Mark 4 uh, earlier in the, this year or late, late last year in our adult Sunday school. It took me seven weeks and I think Mark's was better in uh, 35 minutes. So please listen to it. It is pertinent to what we're going to share here. This is an hour in which the church is, is also being influenced by the world, by politics, by agendas. But we need to understand that in the church, self-interest is uh, an epidemic. It's, an, it's endemic to not hearing Jesus. It's, it's a spiritual pandemic uh, in the heart of the church. The first commandment is you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. The second is you'll love your neighbor as yourself. Notice, love God first, love our neighbor second, Self is a distant third. And when we put self-interest first, we violate the first and the second commandments. And we forfeit hearing what Jesus is really saying. And we can be Christians and go to church and read the Bible and have, have, have all these, these things, these religious activities going on in our lives. And at the heart of the matter is we're putting self first. And we're going to miss what Jesus says. Now that has everything to do with what we're going to share today. Uh, Mountain Moving Faith, uh, the, the, the fifth part of our uh, service, uh, uh, our, our sermon themes for the past few services. But let me read Tyler's Facebook post, 
uh, a message. One Christ follower's thoughts on conspiracy theories. Before you anticipate the kind of post this is, I want to make it clear that I present what I do from a place of one Christ follower's humble opinion. It may shock some of you to find out that I'm not here to debunk the conspiracy theories that are swirling around social media right now, but to acknowledge that there may be some truth found in many of them. I simply have one question to ask of us all. Even if these theories are actually true, hypothetical case, how then should we live as believers? If China is trying to kill us all, how then should we live? If the deep state is stomping on our freedom, how then should we live? If 5G is the real source of the coronavirus, how then shall we live? If the Democrats are just trying to get rid of the president and or the president is trying to cancel the election and set up a dictatorship, how then should we live? If coronavirus isn't real and all of this is being made up to silence the church, how then should we live? And then he says, if blank, fill in the blank, how then sh should we live? And he gives us several options. Number one, be a Christ follower. You can't experience the life that God intended unless you follow in Jesus' footsteps. He never got involved in the controversy of the day, but always kept his eyes on the prize of the establishment of the kingdom of God. We should be people who practice the disciplines of grace, prayer, and the word of God. We must keep our eyes on the prize. Number two, realize people. It is completely normal to try and play the blame game and figure out what is going on around us. But is that advantageous? Remember one of the enemy's greatest tricks is distraction. Number three, live like we believe that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of all Lords. Nothing takes him by surprise. He isn't worried about the present condition of things. He sees everything from an eternal vantage point and what we want in particular in this particular moment of crisis may not be what is best for the ultimate purpose of God. Number four, occupy ourselves with spreading the gospel instead of spreading gossip. It is amazing how we tend to spend so much time espousing things that may or may not be true, but so little time on what we know is absolutely true and will truly transform lives. And uh, Tyler included a number of scripture references, um, but what I'm going to do is simply finish with his concluding words. I hope that I haven't come across as dogmatic or condescending. My comment, you came across as speaking the truth, Tyler. I believe that these truths and many more are what we should be occupying most of our limited time with and leave the other things to the quote-unquote so-called experts to figure out. Thanks for taking the time to read these thoughts. And I also want to add to that before I get into the message. Ed Stetzer wrote um, an article uh, May 17th in Christianity Today, and I'm going to make a few final references to tie together or to reinforce some of the things Tyler said. On Christians spreading corona conspiracies, gullibility is not a spiritual gift. It's by Ed Stetzer. He says, as followers of Jesus, we are people of the truth. Falling for and spreading conspiracy theories does not honor the Lord, but what it does do is cause people to question our judgment. The current global pandemic has created a bumper crop of conspiracy theories. Sadly, Christians seem to be disproportionately fooled by conspiracy theories. Now let me make a comment at that point. Do you know why we are disproportionately fooled by conspiracy theories? Because 
in part, the gospel teaches us there's a great conspiracy going on in human history, and that is to hide the truth that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Messiah, and that he has died for us, been raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, and sent his Holy Spirit for us to bear witness to him and bring this wonderful good news to all the earth. Now, that is a, a legitimate conspiracy theory that's taking place. But as Tyler Lind pointed out in the previous posting, what are we worried about these, these minor conspiracy theories when Jesus has the answer, Jesus is the answer, Jesus has given us the answer to the ultimate conspiracy theory? Let's concentrate on that. I've also said before that when Christians spread lies, they need to repent of those lies. Sharing fake news, sharing conspiracy theories makes us look foolish and it harms our witness. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole article. Um, you can access it uh, by accessing Christianity Today and uh, trying to get into that particular article. But one of the things he points out, a very important thing, two things actually, is first of all, to, to act as if conspiracy theories are true. To promote them, to believe them, is a violation of God's word. Bearing false witness is sin. And to bear false witness is to say something that is a theory is true. Look, if you want to pray about things, if you want to discuss things with your brothers and sisters, uh, I'm concerned about this, I'm worried about this, fine. But that is different from bearing false witness. It is a violation to speak falsehood as if it were truth. The second thing he's saying is then our witness of the truth is affected because, I mean, people look at us and they say, wow, Christians actually believe that? I was right, Christians are nuts. We need to focus in on the truth that is in Jesus. And this leads us into our message today of Mountain Moving Faith. Father, as we continue to attempt to understand Mountain Moving Faith in this hour, Lord God, grant us, grant us grace, Lord, to bear witness to Jesus, to bear witness to the truth, to obey your word, and as we obey your word, to the degree that we obey your word, we will hear your spirit correctly, Father. Help us to have uh, the mountain-moving faith that we need in the name of Jesus. Now, this will be part five of this mountain-moving faith series. The first message was mountain-moving grace, and we spoke out of Zechariah chapter 4. The second message was Mountain Moving Faith, Part 1, and we spoke out of Mark 11. The third message was Ascending the Mountain of the Lord, Part 1, and we looked at the Song of, of Ascents, uh, the, the, the 35 psalms that run from Psalm 120 uh, through 134 in the Psalter, and it, it deals with the songs of praise and worship, that the pilgrims who were ascending the mountain of the Lord to worship the Lord in the temple at the time of the, the yearly pilgrimages and the great feasts of the Jews. And we, we looked at how ascending the mountain, the mountain of the Lord, is what the Lord is calling us to do right now. And then uh, last week we looked at part four, which was mountain moving uh, excuse me, Ascending the Mountain of the Lord, Part 2. And uh, there, there goes my dog. And let's pause for a second. He, he, he's, been, he's been very good so far. But he's, he's not being good right now. And unfortunately, he doesn't listen very well to my wife. She's, she's trying to get him out of here. All right. But Part Two of, of ascending the mountain of the Lord. Last week we looked particularly at Zechariah 14, but we also looked at Isaiah 2. And I want to pick up with Isaiah 2, go back to Mark 11, and uh, tie things together. Now remember, this is what Isaiah 
chapter 2, beginning in the first verse said. This is the point of ascending the mountain of the Lord. Isaiah 2, verse 1, NIV says, This is what Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, in the mountain of the Lord's in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. At the three feasts of the year, when the Jews ascended the Mount Zion, to ascend into the temple and to come before the Lord and worship him at Passover, the Feast of Weeks, which we know as Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, the ingathering, the Feast of the ingathering. As they would come up three times a year to worship the Lord, Isaiah 2 and other eschatological passages were in the background. Zechariah 14 last week, if you didn't hear it, it's an eschatological passage. It's in the background because uh, the Song of Ascents, those 15 psalms, were most likely sung at the Feast of the Tabernacles. But at all the feasts, the Isaiah 2 is in the background. Ascending the mountain of the Lord meant coming into God's presence, submitting to his ways, submitting to his purposes, submitting to his glory. All the nations of the earth would come up. They would not learn war, but they would learn peace. Uh, disputes, legal disputes would be settled on the basis of justice. And people would come together in unity, as Jan quoted from Psalm 133, which is one of the Song of Ascents uh, that would have been sung uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles. All of this would, would have taken place. And the ultimate point is, is that, come, descendants of Jacob, verse 5, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So, when Jesus speaks about moving this mountain that stood before the Jews, and he's making reference to Mount Zion in the context, most of the Jews would have asked themselves, what about Isaiah 2? Why are you saying Zion is going to be moved? Zion is the place that we're supposed to come to see God's purposes triumph in the earth. God's kingdom rule and reign. The shalom of the Lord. The peace of the Lord. The blessings of the Lord. The blessings of the Lord. I excuse me, we need, we need to turn that off. Oh. I'm sorry, we... we we, 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 we put a light on and we're not supposed to have lights in the background. We're learning. We're learning here. any rate, um, so verse 5, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What happens and why would Jesus say that this mountain has to be removed? Well, it's because God's people have self-interest in their heart. It's because God's people, rather than seeking to obey him and establish his purposes, want to see their purposes, their agendas, their desires. That's what's in the background. That is why, and the next place we're going to go to is, is Mark chapter 11. We're going we're to go back to another place where we were, and that's uh, Mark chapter 11. We were there several weeks ago. And what we're seeing here is this is the context for one of the four mountain-moving faith statements that Jesus makes. The context in Mark 11, Jesus is making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the final life of his week. Uh, he's making this triumphal entry. He would be crucified later that week. Uh, of course, he would be raised from the dead 
at the dawn of the following week, but he's making the triumphal entry into Jerusalem means he's coming in as the Messiah. And the first thing that is seen, that the first thing in Mark 11 is the barren fig tree. We talked about that. Jesus curses the barren fig tree. Now, the barren fig tree, uh, the fig tree is a, a symbol of a prosperous Israel, an Israel that would, would every man would, would be under his vine and his fig tree speaks of this fruitful time when God's people are walking in obedience to the Lord, when their sins are forgiven them, when they are seeking his will and seeking his way, the Lord has always promised that prosperity would follow. The fig tree was a sign of that, the fruitfulness of the fig tree, the fruitfulness of the vine. In fact, remember this idea of the land of Canaan being a fruitful land, fig trees, vines, wheat harvest, barley harvest, you know the three festivals all correspond, corresponded to different harvests that took place within Israel. There's a, a religious basis to the feast and there was an agricultural, an economic basis uh, to the feast, a, a, a basis of shalom, of, of, of God blessing his people in, a, in an agricultural society. Uh, uh, lots of crops are, are a sign of the blessings of the Lord. Uh, the Passover corresponded to the earliest harvest, which was the barley harvest. That's the, the first grain uh, that, that bore fruit um, in, a, in a, 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 Jewish, uh, a Jewish farmland. Uh, 50 days later, it's the beginning of the wheat harvest, and that's bread. Um, at the Passover, it was a wave sheaf that was lifted up before the Lord, the sheaf of barley that, that showed that more was coming. Uh, it was a wave loaf that was waved before the Lord at Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks because that's the wheat harvest. Uh, that's that's, a, that's a sustenance. Give us this day our daily bread. And the final harvest was the, the, the greatest of all, the one at Tabernacles or Sukkoth, which was also called the Feast of the Ingathering. That was would be grapes and olives. Very, very uh, significant because not only do grapes and olives provide food, but they provide uh, the anointing oil uh, uh, and, and the, the cup of, of, of wine for God's people. All of this, this idea of harvest, and agricultural blessing and fruitfulness is a picture of a restored garden. See, see, God's original creation purposes are that man should be fruitful and multiply. That's not only the fruit of his body, but everything he put his hand to. And that the garden, which we, we, we saw Eden was a, was, there was a garden within Eden. This, this garden was representative of the blessing of walking in obedience to the Lord, relationship with the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. And, and, and you really have this threefold pattern in creation. You have a garden within what was known as Eden. Eden is the land, the land. And then you see outside the land, you see the, the rivers and the, the tributaries outside of the land of Eden. And that's a picture of the garden is the God's people in God's presence. The land has to do with the land of Israel, our inheritance, and outside of the land, the nations. So, so you see even in the creation picture, this idea of a, of a garden with the Lord, the land of Israel, God's people and their inheritance, and then you see the nations. And that's all from the beginning, from the Genesis narrative. It's fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 2, where we come up to the mountain of the Lord. And all the nations ultimately stream there as God's people come to the garden. The, the temple is a picture of a garden. And, and when you see um, the, the restored temple in the book of, uh, the book of Revelation, at the, the final conclusion of all of God's eschatological purposes, you see a garden restored and you see the nations uh, coming up together with God's people. That's the picture of the gospel. That was the picture of uh, the Old Testament purposes of God. And that's the picture seen in the three feasts, this fruitfulness. So when Jesus comes in Mark 11 and the fig tree is barren, there's no fruit on the fig tree. What's the significance of this? 
something has happened. God's people are once again cast out of the garden. They're, they're in exile. They're not in the place of fruitfulness and blessing and shalom and, and wholeness that will draw the nations to the mountain of the Lord. So Jesus curses the fig tree. Now notice he curses the fig tree. The fig tree is already unfruitful and he curses it. God's curse, what God's curse and God's judgment does is it simply identifies things for what they are. God isn't cursing America right now or, or the world. Things are being exposed in the, in the very heart of America right now, how, how people are acting about this, this pandemic. Uh, things are being exposed. God is cursing. But all cursing does is it isn't the pandemic has caused things that weren't there to happen to, to come to pass. It's exposing what's already there. If, if we don't understand some of these things, if we don't understand and we don't get some of these things, uh, then what is it that the Lord has to repeat for us to get it? Well, that's a, 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 a topic for another time. So Jesus, what's, what is sandwiched between the cursing of the fig tree in Mark 11, uh, 12, 13, and 14, and then the lesson from the fig tree where Jesus speaks of the mountain moving faith in verses 20 and beyond is this cleansing of the temple. And so, so this is what Jesus is doing. When, when Jesus talks about in uh, verse 23 when he says, if you say to this mountain, what, what Jesus means by this mountain has to do with everything with Israel not fulfilling her fig tree, garden restoring, kingdom of God, glorification of God's presence and law at Mount Zion destiny, and they've replaced it. They failed to produce it, and they've replaced it with religion. See, we have this uh, thinking, particularly among like Protestant Christians, born again Christians, evangelical and charismatic Christians, we divide the world into saved and unsaved. God does not look at things as saved and unsaved. So, so anything negative that Jesus speaks in these passages are being spoke to the unsaved. We're the saved, we're in. Well, that's the very mentality that John the Baptist was, was countering when he said, my baptism is a baptism of repentance. He said this at the start of Jesus's ministry and he said, don't say unto yourselves, we are children of Abraham. In other words, don't include yourself as an insider because you go to church or you're saved. He said, God is able to raise up from these stones descendants of Abraham. The in-group, the out-group has to do with being obedient to Jesus. So, so when Jesus is cleansing the temple, he's telling his people, you have made my father's house, which is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. That's Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 is the house of prayer for all nations. You have taken this, and actually his, his quote, uh, my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations, is from later on in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 56, verse 7. You have made it a cave of robbers. It's a place where, where bandits, dangerous bandits, there, there were different uh, Greek words uh, translating different Hebrew words uh, for bandits. And, and these kind of bandits were, were like, um, uh, they'd be like, like, like gangs, uh, 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 violent gangs, gangs walking around with automatic weapons doing ex extremely violent and hostile acts toward people. A den of thieves wasn't, you know, somebody going to a grocery store because uh, they have no money and, and, and trying to pilfer a steak. Okay, these are bands. These are dangerous people. And so the Lord equated what Israel had done with the gospel, with the good news, with the message of the kingdom that runs from Genesis all the way through Malachi, that runs for us as Christians from, from Matthew to Revelation. What they have done is they had taken it over 
and use Christ, use God's word as a cloak for their sin. Uh, what, what, what they had done was they usur you, usurped the, the gospel. So this cleansing of the temple, when, when, the, when the Jews would ask Jesus, why are you saying these things, Lord? And, and, and let's pick up what, what he's saying. We'll, we'll pick it up with, uh, with verse 20 of Mark 11. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have God faith. We, 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 we translated that. It could be translated have faith in God or it could be translated have the faith of God. But the way to, to, to get around the, the linguistic difficulty is just to say, Jesus is saying have God-like faith. The God-like faith is the faith that's going to bring Isaiah chapter 2 to pass. The God faith is going to bring the gospel to pass. The God faith is going to be the faith that causes uh, the Messiah to be recognized. Have God faith. For assuredly I say in you, whoever says to this mountain, this mountain, he's, he's looking at Zion. He's looking at the Mount of Olives. He's, he's looking at mountains that represent the place where God's presence dwells in Jerusalem. For I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now, now let's stop there, because it's at this point that the disciples would say, well, what about Isaiah chapter 2? God's going to deliver Israel. God, God's not trying to remove Mount Zion. He wants to establish Mount Zion. Well, what about Zechariah 14, Lord? God is going to restore Jerusalem when Jerusalem's enemies come to destroy Jerusalem. Now, what, what they're looking at there is an external enemy. And there are external enemies uh, to God's kingdom. We, we understand they're external enemies. The devil's an external enemy. The, uh, the enemies of God's people who persecute God's people, they're, they're, they're external enemies. The, the opposition that comes from outside of us uh, to, to uh, hinder gospel-driven, biblically formed Christian values from being practiced in the church and being declared in the earth. Those are external enemies. But Jesus is saying, wait a second, wait a second. Why am I talking about the mountain of Zion being removed? Now we know Jesus is, is going to prophesy. This is in Mark 11. In Mark 13, he's going to prophesy about the destruction of Jerusalem that's going to take place uh, within the the lifetime of many of the disciples who are, are standing at this point with the, the pre-crucified, pre-resurrected Jesus. In, in, in Matthew, where we look at it, the parallel passage is Matthew 21, and it's, it's emphasizing similar things. It talks about mountain moving faith there. In Matthew 21, it's a parallel to Mark 11. In Matthew 24, Jesus is going to speak of the, the destruction of the temple. Why is the temple going to be destroyed? Why does, what mountain are we talking about being removed? It's first an internal enemy that has to be removed from God's people. And God's faith is really the faith to appropriate God's will. It's the faith to see who Jesus is. He's Messiah. The leaders of the Jews are opposing Jesus right now, and they're going to turn the people's hearts against Jesus because their whole goal is self-interest. They have a desire in being in power. They have a desire of staying in power. They have a desire for, for having a, a, a life of comfort, and they'll get that by staying in power. They're compromised. They have taken God's word, and although they preach truth at times, the thrust behind it is self-interest. And you see, when, when leaders are preaching self-interest, 
That's an anointing, another kind of anointing. Jan was talking about the anointing that came on Aaron in Psalm 33 uh, for communion. That's an anointing that comes from Jesus, and it's the head, Jesus is anointed. Aaron typifies Jesus. When Jesus is anointed by God, the anointing oil comes down on the rest of his body. It flows down his garment, his beard, his garment. Hey, in terms of recognizing that we're part of the body of Christ, who's the beard? I'm the beard. Okay, sorry. But the point is, is the, the, the anointing flows down the beard, it flows down the garment, it flows down to the very feet. The anointing of Jesus will flow down to his disciples. What's Jesus' anointing? I come to do your will, O Lord. What's Jesus is doing? Suffer this to be now, John, for of such is all righteousness. What is the anointing on Jesus? I would rather die than disobey the Lord. See, that's an anointing. And when that anointing is in the body of Christ, in fivefold ministry, in, in leaders in the body of Christ, authentic apostles, authentic prophets, authentic pastors, authentic teachers, authentic evangelists, when that anointing is there in the leadership, it, it flows down to the rest of the body and, and it forms people's hearts. It shapes them into the image of God. It makes people disciples. It takes disciples to make disciples. It takes a disciple to raise a village of disciples. But when you have leaders, and, and this is the, the, the meaning here in Mark chapter 11, Jesus in the gospel story goes after the leaders of the Jewish people more than he goes after the people. That's why he, he would sit with Pharisees, uh, excuse me, he would sit with, uh, sit with, with uh, tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners and people who were unclean. He didn't go after them. The only way he went after them was as a shepherd who, who has uh, lost a sheep coming to restore it. When he went after somebody with full force and full weight, he went after the leaders of the Jewish people. Why? Because they had usurped God's authority. They had changed God's house into a house that was motivated by self-interest. Okay? Self-interest was why the temple was destroyed. Self-interest was why Jesus cleansed the temple at this point. Remember what, what Jesus did when he cleansed the temple earlier in verse 15 in that chapter. He said, after saying, let no one eat fruit from this fig tree ever again, then he went and worked out the cursing of the fig tree in the temple. And verse 15 said, so they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and to be, began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. Then he taught saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? You've made it a cave of robbers. It's where the robbers go out and, and pilfer and violate and harm God's people, and then they go hide in caves from the authorities. And Jesus is saying, The leaders are doing this. And see, when you have a culture of self-interest, among the people of God, it's because leadership is driven by self-interest. Let me say this. When I evaluate my leaders at Lord of the Harvest, when I evaluate future leaders at Lord of the Harvest, when I teach others to evaluate leaders, potential leaders, are they driven by self-interest or are they driven by serving the Lord? This self-interest that was the driving factor in the leadership of God's people at that time was the reason they rejected Jesus because Jesus didn't come to fulfill their self-interest. Jesus came to establish Zion, the mountain of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the law of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the ways of the Lord that all nations might come and worship the Lord. 
So when you see a culture of self-interest in God's people, and may I, may, I, may I sum up American Christianity very simply, culture of self-interest. Now there, there are valid disciples, there are valid preachers of the gospel, there are people who live out their faith, who trust in Jesus, who believe everything that Jesus has done for them, but there is a culture of self-interest that dominates the house of God. Why has the Lord allowed this global pandemic? He's dealing with self-interest. He wants repentance. That's what's going on here. Mountain moving faith means repent and remove being driven by self-interest in the house of God and begin to establish Jerusalem as the chief of mountains in all the earth. So, the internal enemy of self-interest must be dethroned and God faith seeks God's will, embraces God's will, practices God's will, and then proclaims God's will in both word and deed. This is the mountain that has to be removed. So when the disciples say, what about Isaiah 2? The Lord's saying, oh yes, I'm here to establish Isaiah chapter 2. But the temple has to be cleansed. The temple has to be purified first. But Jesus adds, adds uh, something else. He adds this in verse 24, and I, I do not want us to, to miss this. Jesus says, Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. The first hindrance to mountain-moving faith, at least from this passage, is unbelief. And unbelief has to do with not appropriating God's will, not seeing God's man for who he is. You, you understand that the disciples were still looking for a Jesus to come and first remove external enemies. That's the Messiah they were looking for. And they believed he was the Messiah, so they believed he's going after Rome. But Jesus says, well, we'll take care of Rome when, when we need to take care of Rome. But we have to deal with the internal enemy. And the internal enemy is religion versus Christ. It's religion versus obedience. It's self-interest versus being a disciple. That has to be removed. So faith, mountain-moving faith, has nothing to do with, I have the faith to get what I want, and I'm just going to keep naming it and claiming it and naming it and claiming it. All that is is, I have faith for my self-interests. Well, that's, that's, that's not the, the faith that Jesus is saying here. The doubt that we experience is when Jesus confronts us with what his will actually is, and we, really, we say, you really want that, Lord? Is, is that humanly possible? I mean, Lord, you're telling me to deny myself, lay, lay my life aside, lay all my interests, my desires, my agendas aside and put you first. And then even, then can I get to my de desires? No, you have to put others second. Then can I get to my desires? Well, your desires will be fulfilled when you put God and others first and second. That's the doubt. The doubt is, Lord, how is it that we can actually embrace your will the way you desire it to be embraced. That's the doubt that hinders mountain moving faith in this context, in the context of this passage. There's, there, there's, a, there's another aspect to doubt too. The other aspect to doubt is no matter what these disciples of Jesus thought about Jesus, they'd been raised in their Jewish faith all their lives. And, and, you know, whatever generation finds itself in Christ, we, we think that what our generation has believed is what the church has believed for 2,000 years. So we have a mindset, a worldview, a non-biblical worldview that, well, the way Christianity has been portrayed to me all my life is how it really is. And Jesus is telling them, not necessarily. Not, not, I, I, we're not denying the, those, the, the truths, the, the, the biblical and the creedal truths that the church has espoused for 2,000 years of her existence. We're talking about the, the so-called Christian culture. The so-called Christian culture 
that we have accepted as true, that creates a consternation, uncertainty, doubt within us. H how can I say this sacred cow that I have embraced my whole life, that I've been told that everybody in my church around me embraces is contrary to the gospel. It's a veil. It's a veil over our heart. So Jesus is talking about confronting the internal veils, the sin, the internal enemies that have reconfigured our Christian faith to be as inconsistent with the gospel as the Jews at the time of Christ, as their Judaism was inconsistent with the word of the Messiah. I remember Pastor Dick Bieber taught this many years ago at the Fisherman's Net, and he was talking about, uh, and I've always, I always say this about Dick, he was the master of the 20-minute sermon. He, he could speak in 20 minutes, what takes me seven weeks, and Mark Palladino demonstrated that this morning. Mark, uh, I, I don't know that you're listening, but I, I'll, I'll give you a shout-out anyways. That was, you came in the spirit of Dick Bieber this morning. You said it all in 30 minutes. And I guess he inspired me a lot to, to, to do what I'm sharing here, but mine won't be 20 minutes. But Dick came and he was talking about Caiaphas. And he said, do you think that Caiaphas, you know, he, this young man, and he, he laid this out so beautifully about Caiaphas being a young man raised in the faith, raised in the scripture, raised in, on the expectation and the hope that this year in Jerusalem, Messiah would come. He said, do you think Caiaphas ever said once as he was growing up, when I grow up, I want to murder the Messiah. I want to crucify the Messiah. And man, when Dick said that, it was like, and, and, and what, what, do we, what do we say in our own hearts? Well, he never said that, but he did. Because when it came down to choosing between self-interest and the kingdom of God, he chose self-interest. So there's this culture of self-interest. And the second difficulty for us is not just the enormity of the implications of what Jesus says for us. Yes, put God first, put others second, and well, maybe we'll think about yourself a distant third or a distant 33rd or a distant uh, 333,000. <laughs> but the other thing is to recognize that we have ingrained in our brains things that we think are Christian that have nothing to do with the gospel. Now, I've been warning this since back in the Jesus movement, and I'm going to say it again, and, 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 and people either kind of smile what I, at it, what I say and just kind of just dismiss it or, or get angry with what I say. But we have substituted America the beautiful with Christianity in many things in our brains. And they are not the same. And in fact, I would say that cultural ethos that makes us at times more American than Christian, we embrace America instead of embracing, embracing Christianity. That ethos that makes us that is the same false religious culture that the Jews had. It was about being a Jew versus being a follower of the living God. And so what was ex expedient politically, economically, socially in being a Jew at that time caused them to miss the Messiah and not see the Messiah. But Jesus adds another thing in verse 25. So doubt in our hearts because of those situations, doubt in our heart will stop us from saying to the mountain, mountain be removed, because the very thing that causes us doubt in our heart is the internal enemy that has to be broken. Its grip upon our hearts and minds has to be broken. But there's another thing here. Let, 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 let me deal with another kind of person. Now, there'll be people who are cheering me there and saying, yeah, amen, Pastor Oz, amen, Brother Oz, you tell it like it is. And all those idiots out there, all those jerks out there, all those, those people that call themselves Christians that aren't really Christians, oh man, they're going to get theirs and, and, and we're with you. And Jesus says, but you can't do that either. Jesus says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Mountain moving faith can be hindered by doubt 
and unbelief, mountain-moving faith can be hindered by unforgiveness. We, Mark mentioned this morning, we live in a therapeutic society. Much of the, the drive for self-interest is, poor me, I'm a victim, my parents hurt me, my husband hurt me, this one hurt me, that one hurt me. And, and again, we're not dealing with the legitimacy of oppression, the legitimacy of violence, the legitimacy of abuse. But we're talking about people who have formed a martyr complex. Not being a martyr for bearing witness to Jesus, but a martyr in terms of, I'm so hurt, I'm so wounded. A therapeutic mentality revolves around self-interest, and self-interest is promoted by, I live my entire life, you hurt me, you can't say this, you can't do this, you hurt me, but I can say this, and I can do this to you because you hurt me. And there is this unwillingness to forgive, and the reason there's an unwillingness to forgive is because I like the fact that I can use my woundedness to be vindictive. I can use my woundedness to uncover other people's sin. I can use my woundedness to say, why are you bullying me? I can use my woundedness for all kinds of excuses to allow all kinds of what? Internal issues to still dominate my life. The interesting thing here that Jesus is saying, he's saying, yeah, judgment is coming upon those leaders who have inflicted harm on my people. Judgment is coming on this spirit of religion, but I will not allow vindictiveness to drive what I do. See, you can allow your own position of power and self-esteem to drive you, but you can also be vindictive toward people that hurt you, and you can allow that to drive you too. And Jesus says, neither one drives me. The only thing that's acceptable is the will of my Father in heaven. And on the cross, the very people who were vindictive to me, the very cave of robbers who have crucified me, I'm going to say, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing because Jesus will only be driven by the will of God. So, what is mountain-moving faith? Mountain-moving faith is faith that's rooted in being driven by the will of God. And forgiveness is, forgiveness is like near the very core of what it means to be obedient to Jesus. Do you understand that Jesus is a forgiving God? Now, if you have a, a King James or a New King James, the next verse says, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses, which Jesus also says in the Sermon on the Mount. But here in Mark eleven twenty six, some of your Greek texts leave that verse out. But hopefully they, you have it as a footnote in your Bible because Jesus is saying the core of being obedient to the Lord, the core of mountain-moving faith is God's will, and it is God's will to forgive. Do you forgive people because they're, they've gotten right with you? You hurt me, I'll forgive you when you stop hurting me. That's not biblical forgiveness. Biblical forgiveness is, I forgive you. And the reason you forgive people, and this is what's so powerful about mountain-moving faith, when you forgive people, first of all, you free yourself from being driven by anything other than God's will, and God's will is mercy. But second, you free other people to get whole and to get well. Do you know when you don't forgive people their sins, even, even when they've legitimately sinned against you, you're holding them in bondage to your lack of forgiveness. In other words, the very thing that they've done to you, now you're going to do back to them. That's called vengeance, brethren. So mountain-moving faith has everything in the world to do with faith, not doubting in our hearts, seeking the will of God, and forgiveness. Now I've got, 
I've got just a couple minutes and I, I what I want to do is I want to go on to a second passage and just do 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 a, a, a brief sketch because not everything not everything is moving this this mountain of false religion this mountain of 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 uh, a temple that needs to be cleansed I just want you to see and let's let's go to Matthew 17. Jan spoke from Psalm 133 while you're on your way to Matthew 17. This is a second mountain moving faith passage. Jan spoke of the dew that is on Mount Hermon and the dew that is on Mount Zion. Now she mentioned that Hermon was higher than Zion. That's, that's correct. But the other thing about the relationship, that's a mountain range that runs throughout the, the land of Israel. And Hermon is the northern range of the mountain where Zion is closer to the southern range of the mountain. So this Hermon to Zion is talking about the entire mountain range that, that compasses Israel, that speaks of the land of inheritance. There's going to be dew from Hermon to Zion. The Lord's anointing is going to cover it all. What Jesus is going to do is going to affect all of the land. And remember, the land is important because the land is given as an inheritance to God's people when they come out of Egypt on the Passover. The land is given to them. It's their inheritance. So when we speak of that threefold division in the creation story, there's a garden. That's Mount Zion. There's a, a land. That's Eden. That's Hermon to Zion. And then there's the nations outside of that land. There's always this picture of the restoration of creation. Keep in mind the gospel is a uh, it's a creation story. It's creation restored. It's what God set out in the beginning in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 before the fall of the man and the woman, before the man and the woman were cast out of the garden. The, the creation purposes is to start in a garden, purify the land, and then ultimately bring God's dominion and his kingdom to the entire earth to all the nations. And remember, God's kingdom is about access to God's blessing. See, we have to think of the kingdom right. Uh, kingdom isn't controlling people and ruling over people and telling people what to do. See, we, we have this, this worldly concept of authority. You know, kingdom is exercised by kings. We're kings and priests. The church, God's people, it's a kingdom of priests. And, and if, if we substitute worldly understanding of power, I'm the boss of you. I tell you what to do. I exercise uh, my authority based on my self-interest. You do. Kingdom is that God wants to release his blessings to his entire creation. His people are the vehicle of release. We're talking about a few problems here, technical problems. Hopefully I'm back and I can conclude this. So Hermon is the northern border of the kingdom. It's the northern border of Israel. It's interesting because in, in Matthew 16, they're in the district of Caesarea Philippi. In Matthew 16, where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my Father in heaven, and I shall call you Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of death, the gates of Hades, the gates of the grave will not prevail against it. That's all in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi. When you were moving out of Galilee in the Caesarea Philippi, you were moving into the realm of the Gentiles, the realm of the nation, some of the furthest borders of the, the territory that God had originally given uh, uh, to the children of Israel. Now, the, the borders that the Lord promised uh, were, 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 were from Israel to the Tigris-Euphrates River. I mean, so it's, it's encompassing all the nations outside. But the borders of the, the nation of Israel versus the Gentile territory, it's Mount Hermon there. And since Matthew 16 takes place around Caesarea Philippi and 
the disciples ascend the mountain of transfiguration in Matthew 17. It says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Now the six days, is it could, could have mean they went back to Galilee. But again, the geographical context that, that Matthew has established here probably puts the mountain of transfiguration as being Mount Hermon. Now that's important to recognize. Jesus is transfigured, Moses and Elijah are there, the disciples see Moses and Elijah. Wow, this is awesome, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus, uh, Moses and Elijah here, Jesus is one of the guys. You know, let's, let's, let's build uh, a booths. Let's celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and let's have Moses in one and Jesus in one and Elijah in one and we're going to be in one. And, and the voice from heaven says, nope, Jesus isn't buddies with Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah are the two greatest witnesses in, in, in Jewish history. When we talk about apostolic and prophetic witness in the Old Testament, it's Moses the apostle and, and, and Elijah uh, the prophet. Moses, the, the apostle par excellence, and Elijah, the prophet par excellence. And you'll say, I thought Moses was a prophet. Teaching for another time, okay. And Jesus isn't one of the, one of the guys. Jesus is their master and their Lord. And the voice says, hear my beloved son. He has greater authority than Moses and Elijah. Well, we know there's this great transfiguration. And then if, if we pick it up at verse 14 in Matthew 17, and when they had come to the multitude, they come down from the mountains, uh, from that mountain, that transfiguration experience, which is a pre-shadowing, a prefiguring of the resurrection of Jesus. It's actually a, a clearer description of what took place in the resurrection than any of the gospel accounts give. Uh, they talk more about angels appearing. Now, Jesus walked with the disciples uh, on the road to Emmaus, but this is a picture of this, this, the glory. Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, Paul says in Romans 6, and that's what the transfiguration is a picture of. But they come down from the mountain. Uh, Jesus predicts a second time he's going to die. The disciples say, no way, Lord. See, self-interest. That's not the kind of Messiah they're looking for. They don't, they're not looking for a Messiah who's going to suffer and die. They're, gonna, they're looking for a Messiah that's going to crush the heads of the enemies of God's people. And again, when we look, I, and I'm, this, is just, this is an exhortation for you, brethren. Christian political thinking aligning itself with certain political ideology. Is it, which... which which picture of Jesus is it more like? Is it like the suffering Messiah who lays down his life for his people, who, who is vindicated by his martyrdom? Or are we thinking in our American political ideology? Yes, God is on our side to crush all our enemies. Well, we may be more like the disciples' flawed and faulty thinking than a gospel-driven biblical oriented thinking. So 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 they 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 they're still not hearing that because of self-interest. See, we can superimpose on Jesus the kind of messiah we want him to be. And it's not necessarily the kind of messiah he is. That that all goes along with what Mark said and what what I've been sharing all along here today about internal enemies. So they come down from the mountain and in verse 14, his disciples went to the multitude. Now, here's, here's my reasoning here. Here's my what's inferred in the context. If you're coming down off Hermon, if you're in a Caesarea Philippi district, what kind of people are you coming down to? Gentile people, non-Jewish people. Now, Jewish people live there. It was, it was, it was a mixture of people. But there are people there that they're going to be confronting, and it's, it's, it's germane to the interpretation of mountain moving faith in Matthew 17 to get this. But the people they're coming down to are, are a whole different kind of people. They're not, they don't have a Christian mentality. They're pure Gentiles, non Jews, non religious. A man comes to Jesus at the foot of this mountain 
from a Gentile chariot territory, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Okay. Now, we all know Jesus is loving. Jesus is affirming. Jesus would never say anything negative to me, would he? Jesus would, you know, Jesus is just always loving and kind. I mean, he's like a sugar daddy. He's like a hippie with long hair. He's like an elderly grandfather that just lets his grandchildren do anything around the house. Well, let's see. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation. Your disciples couldn't heal him. They couldn't cast the demon out of him, Lord. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? The Lord is like saying, you know, I'm, I'm fed up. I'm, I'm out of here. Look, sorry, Father. Yeah, I, I can't deal with this. Anymore. These disciples of mine make me crazy, Lord. They don't get it. What's it going to take? They just saw the, the flipping transfiguration. They saw me on the mountain. The real Moses, the real Elijah were there. Remember the thing about Moses. Moses, nobody knows where he was buried. God buried him. Elijah went directly to heaven. That's not like some vision of Moses and Elijah. That's the real Moses and the real Elijah. They heard a voice. They heard the Father from heaven. Gee, if you didn't hear it at Jesus' baptism, guys, how about hearing it on the Mount of Transfiguration? You've ascended the mountain. And this is the mountain of the Lord. You've ascended the mountain. The mountain of the Lord isn't Zion back there where, where religious authorities have subverted the authority of Scripture and have superimposed their own concept of God's ways and purposes onto the people. No, this is Mount Hermon where Jesus is transfigured, seen in all his glory, seen in all his lordship. No, no, nothing, no fake news here. Real Jesus. Fake news from Zion, real news from Hermon. And now you can't cast this demon out? Jesus says, I can't take this anymore. And then he continues, how long will I put up with you? Now, if Pastor Oz would say that to somebody, Pastor Oz would be a, just a, 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 an abusive man because he, 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 he dared say something that didn't affirm me in my self-driven interests. Self-driven interests, which, which, by the way, have just revealed themselves when Jesus again tells them he's going to die, and they're like, yeah, right, Jesus. You're going to do what we want you to do, Jesus. You're, uh, you're my Messiah. You're my personal Savior. My per what does that mean, my personal Savior? Jesus isn't my personal Savior. Jesus died for the church. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's our Savior. Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. The disciples can't rebuke it. Jesus can rebuke it. Is the point that there are some demons that we can't rebuke, but only Jesus can? Yes and no. We are given God's authority to break demon power. But here's the context, brethren. We're going to confront demons out there that are different from the demons we confront in here. We confront demons in the church all the time, religious spirits, foolishness, Christians being disobedient, Christians not trusting Jesus. We confront those kind of things. But out there, see, this is Gentile territory. See, the world the way it is now, Demons are being manifested and released that we've never seen. Demons are going to be released and manifested that we've never confronted. And they're going to throw us for a loop. They're going to throw us for a loop. Demons that come out easily among Christians, maybe even uh, in certain situations in the world, we preach the gospel, the demons are broken, people get saved. But we're going to confront things. How about one called pandemic, global pandemic, 
COVID-19. Maybe that's a demon yet. We, we haven't learned how to master yet. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? Here's our, our mountain moving faith. Because of your unbelief. Again, it's unbelief. But it's unbelief because we're being shocked. See, another source of unbelief, it can be not seeking God's will and dealing with our internal enemies. It can be lack of forgiveness. But it can also be being shocked with how big and powerful darkness is out there. So when Christians say, man, darkness is getting bigger and powerful out there, amen. Greater devils for deeper levels. As we go deeper with Jesus, we are going to face some demons that we've never seen before. And they're out there, brethren. They're out there. So Jesus said to him, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say unto you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now it's tiny faith. But see, the mustard seed, Jesus already said in Matthew 13, is equated with the kingdom, the word of the kingdom. If we have mustard seed faith, kingdom driven, kingdom oriented, kingdom producing mustard seed faith, as small as it is, if our lives are focused on God's kingdom, if we have that kind of faith, as small as it is, it's going to break demon power. Small mustard seed, kingdom-driven, gospel-driven, Christ-glorifying, Christ-centered faith, even on a mustard seed level, can break the power of big demons. If we're not breaking the power of demons, if there are demonic structures at work in our lives that we're not breaking, why? Look to your heart. Is the kingdom your motivation is God's glory, is loving God first and loving others second, and Christ's authority in your life, Christ's work as the center of your life. If that's not there, you're not going to be able to break the demon power. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, again, I'm reading New King James. I'm going to close here. New King James does not have verse 21 in it. it the, 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 outside of New King James, excuse me, doesn't have verse 21 in it. So if you're reading a translation other than King James or, or New King James, this should be a footnote because it's, it's a, the modern translations for the most part. There are a few exceptions. I always, I always look for the missing verses from, from the King James and the New King James when I open a translation and I know automatically which Greek text it's based on. The majority of modern translations are based on an older Greek text. King James, New King James, and a few others are based on the majority of the Greek texts but later texts, not earlier texts. And so that's, that's why you have this, 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 uh, this, this problem with translations. It's some say the older texts are the better. Others say, well, they're older, but we only have a few of them. We have all kinds of Greek texts that the King James and the New King James are based on. So we're going to go with the majority. That's why they sometimes call it the majority text. So it's not there outside of the New King James, but Jesus says, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now what Jesus is saying in the King James Greek text is, there are some demons, they don't go out instantly. There's going to be a process. Prayer and fasting is a process. Prayer and fasting speaks of not individual prayer and fasting, but collective prayer and fasting. What it's saying is it's going to take unity. It's going to take a process. It's going to take working it out with God for this thing to move. Some demons go instantly. Some things in our life we break quickly. Others take time. Keep that in mind in terms of this quote-unquote lockdown here. Unity is a key. Now, if you go over to Mark's version, of, of, of this story, and Mark's version is in Mark 9, and you don't have to go. That text says, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer. And then the, the King James says prayer and fasting. So, so every translation we use says, some don't go out except we gather together in unity and pray. So mountain-moving faith also can be hindered by lack of a kingdom perspective. It can be hindered by lack of prayer. It can be hindered by lack of spiritual discipline, that's what fasting is, and it can be greatly hindered by 
lack of unity. So Father, um, I'm going to close in prayer. Jan is going to finish up with a, with a closing prayer, then I'll, I'll, I'll do the announcements and we'll close. Lord, thank you for this word. I pray that your church, from, from debunking conspiracy theories to self-interest to mountain-moving faith, I pray that your church will hear these, these words in this hour and become conformed to your image and learn what you want us to learn. Lord, we don't want to miss the lesson of what Jesus is teaching the church in a global pandemic. We do not want to learn. And I don't even mean to suggest it's a single lesson. It may be a broad lesson. And Lord, if we don't learn the lesson, well, then something else will come for us to learn the lesson. May we learn the lesson. May there be a mounting move of mountain-moving faith in your church right now to, to break the power of religion, the power of unforgiveness, the power of a lack of a kingdom perspective, the power of a lack of commitment to you, Lord, in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Pastor Jan. Well, I sure learned a lot today. <laughs> Um, and I really am so thankful um, for the Word of God that has been presented today by um, Mark and my husband. I learned so, so much. Um, I went back to reading this week, and I'm reading a historical fiction book, and it's about, it's called The Book of Lost Friends, and it's about um, in the South, in Louisiana in particular, when slaves were um, sold, um, they would lose contact with their friends and family. So the book kind of uh, focuses on that. But there's one quote, I just it just hit me because I just read it last night. I, th I thought it was really provoking. Um, it was a, 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 a black mother um, talking to her little girl and she said your heart is good don't let the bad get in and I thought to myself how profound that statement was when we're born our hearts are good it's when we grow up and we let the bad get in and I think what was spoken today was giving us an opportunity to get the bad out to really go before God and get the bad out. So I'm really thankful again for the word that was put forth. I would encourage people to um, go back and listen to it again. And even God would um, open up things, revelation to you that you may add on to that, what was spoken. In closing, I just want to say that this week, um, my youngest uh, will turn 40. And so I just want to say to him, happy birthday, Joel. We love you. And we're proud of you. And um, hope you have another 40 plus. So, uh, dear God, we um, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to go deeper, to really go and look at our hearts what is it that we really prize? What is it that we really treasure? Do we keep bad things in our heart? Things that you want us to get rid of? Lord, we pray we're pure hearted. You know, there, there's people I can think of in the body that really are pure hearted people. They have no guile. We all need to be like that. We can't expect the world at this point to be like that because they don't know the truth. But we know the truth. And we need to be guided by that. We need to have the nature of Jesus within us. And I like when Pastor said, He's not my personal Savior. That really hit me because we hear that all the time. He's our Savior. And I also like the idea that faith is the size of a Mustard seed, well, we know it's like one of the smallest seeds, and yet it produces one of the largest 
trees, bushes, whatever you call it. And that's incredible that if we can take that seed and walk with Jesus in all his principles, that we can, we can see the fruitfulness. And it just occurred to me that if I just take that little seed and tell people about Jesus and act like I love Jesus, that, that the, the fold, that the, the produce will be uh, over a hundredfold. I mean, I kept thinking last night of when Steve spoke, that word went out. That word went out. That little mustard seed went out. And the seed that was deposited, and it's interesting because that's what Mark talked about today. Where will that seed land in people's hearts? What kind of soil do you have there? So I thank you, Lord, for, uh, again, preparing us for what you're doing in this hour. Thank you, Lord, for tilling the soil in our hearts, Lord. We get rid of the bad and really water the good. Water that mustard seed so it may grow and grow and grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to close with the announcements. My dog was very good except for one uprising. He's actually sitting here next to us. Uh, but you can't see him on the uh, couch because he's a little guy. Um, closing with announcements. Uh, we um, will be back for right now. We are continuing to live stream and we will be back next Sunday, 10 a.m. for our Bible study and 11 a.m. for the church service. Uh, there is there is there's another, at least one more message on mountain moving faith that I have. That's Luke 17. Uh, we have to look at, at sycamore tree moving faith, which Jesus uh, declared. Uh, but we'll be back at 11 a.m. next Sunday. Our tithes and offerings. We do have a PayPal account uh, for those who will not be attending church but would still like to send their tithe. And you can go to LHCF Lord Harvest. Christian Fellowship, LHCF Warren, one word, uh, dot com, and go to the support and click on donate, and you can actually do that by PayPal, or you can uh, send us uh, a check to our post office box, which is P.O. Box 26505, Fraser, Michigan, 48026. It's post office box 26505, Fraser, Michigan, 48026. Make the check out to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Now, we, we are actually, we have started a special mission collection uh, for the church in Uganda right now. And you may want to designate an offering going to um, Uganda uh, for their support. They are suffering besides all the things they normally suffer with. They've got locusts. They've got the, the COVID-19. It's just unbelievable. And Jan mentioned uh, the church in New York City helping uh, the church in uh, Mexico, all over the world. But I want to I want to take a moment though here to really commend. Uh, it's been amazing. I mean, since this pandemic, and I know many churches are struggling. Many are. The giving has been incredible to Lord of the Harvest right now. It's just the, both from members of our own congregation and people who aren't even from our congregation. And I really, I want to thank you in the name of Jesus for doing that. I, I want to point out to you how we function at Lord of the Harvest. We do not have a huge budget. We are by no means a, 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 an impoverished church. I, I fellowship with so many churches that if, if, if their, their budget were close to ours, they, they'd, they'd be rejoicing. Uh, but 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 we don't have a large budget. I mean, we get money in and money goes out. And some of you may have seen I sent out to some of you and uh, the the notice that on Friday, uh, the um, group sponsored by Focus on the Family, which is known as Churches Helping Churches. And honestly, if you want to go to a worthy cause, go to the Facebook page for Focus on the Family and look up Churches Helping Churches. 
what there there was a there was a um, a fundraiser was on Friday night, and if you got to watch it, it was it was tremendous. There was just some tremendous worship, some tremendous words of the Lord being spoken by ministers, pro pro athletes, uh, Christian uh, worship leaders, and and musicians. Just it was it was a tremendous. Uh, Linda, uh, shout out to Linda Matthews uh, from our congregation who uh, shared that with me. And by the way, a shout out to uh, Ann Bussell who who shared Tyler Lyons uh, Facebook uh, comment uh, with me that I, I read today and shared with our church. But churches helping churches, they're raising money for one reason. They're, they're giving grants to poor churches, impoverished churches, predominantly urban churches, churches and rural churches, churches that are struggling right now because of their own poverty before they started this and are being so hit uh, by, the, uh, by the coronavirus right now and the shutdowns and the economic implications. And they're sending money to churches just to help them out. They're, they're, they're giving $3,000 grants to churches that are applying for this. It's, it's marvelous to support that. But let me tell you this about Lord of the Harvest. In the last few weeks, we have sent, and this is from the money that's just coming into us, it's going right back out the door. We have sent $6,000. Our church, which again, we don't have a large budget, we've sent $6,000 out. We've sent it to a, an urban congregation. We've sent something to a, um, a hurting church in New York City that we're in relationship with. And we've sent money to Uganda. And we're gonna continue to do that. So I just wanna tell you, the money that you're sending to us, it's going places, and it's not like going to pay uh, just Pastor Oz's salary. Uh, praise God, Pastor Oz doesn't need much of a, of a salary uh, at this stage of my life. God, God, has, God has been good. It's going out. We've been able to help some needy members in our congregation, and I just want to commend those both in our congregation and thank those outside of our congregation who are sending us finances. Last couple announcements. Our Kingdom Education class will resume this Wednesday, May 20th. Pastor Adrian Bird is teaching a Kingdom Education class. It's a Zoom meeting format, so you have to apply so you can get an invite to the class. So send, uh, uh, if you're interested in any of these online classes, Lord of the Harvest, LHCF1, number one, uh, at comcast.net and or go on our website if you want to be part of the kingdom education wednesday may 20th from 6 15 to 7 30 it's every other wednesday our food pantry and that's another area where our your donations work it's continuing to fund our food pantry it's still open two days a week tuesdays and wednesdays from 9 to 11 a.m and we're giving out food in a drive-through format only if you read the article from the Detroit News yesterday, the, the sources that food banks have for food, at, that's running out. Everything is being affected. There's, it's, it's a chain reaction. Enough food isn't being produced to, to, to even replenish everything in our groceries and in particular for those people who are in need. So we really need to pray. We really need to pray for God to move uh, as far as continuing to sustain people there are people right now who never thought, even a few months ago, that they'd have to go to a food pantry for food, but because their, their, their job was canceled, they're not able to get that. So, so we are praying for God's wisdom uh, as we reopen things uh, in our, our nation to balance health with the economy. We need wisdom, and we need to do it right, and we need to do it properly, and we don't need to go back like nothing has happened. Everything's fine, let's just go back to normal. We're, we're, we're not in a normal situation. That's another, uh, that's another uh, topic for another time. Walter Brueggemann has just put out a book, Virus uh, as, a, um, as a Source of Faith. I, I, I'm, I'm, quoting it from my memory. I don't even know if it's uh, if that's the correct title. It's virus and faith is in it, but he's talking about how this, this virus is a call for us to walk in faith. And he, he likens it, what's taken place now in the pandemic with what happened to the Jews when they returned from exile. When they returned from exile and saw their devastated nation, 
They'd been gone for 70 years and Nebuchadnezzar devastated the nation. When they came back, there was a desire in their heart to return to normal. And return from exile is never a return to normal. We have to make changes to our lives, permanent changes. And so when you look at the, the, the prophecies, particularly in the Isaiah 40 through 66, those are all prophecies about returning from exile. And it's always saying the Lord says, I'm going to do a new thing. And the new thing that God is going to do is give us new imagination, give us new vision, give us new strategies to live out our lives differently because they will never be the same. I know I'm, 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 I'm giving some of my views on this whole lockdown, but remember the last world global pandemic we had was the Spanish flu. And there was lockdown, there was shutdown, there was social distancing, you know, uh, uh, the, the way you did it 100 years ago. But the World War one ended during that Spanish flu pandemic and everybody got together and 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 had these big parties and these big celebrations because World War I had ended and the pandemic, the virus, the flu came back with at a greater level than it had been in the first phase of it. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We we we, we need to we need to utilize we need to utilize the wisdom that God has given us. And, and by the way, God gives uh, people with scientific and medical backgrounds wisdom, brethren. We, we, we need to see this. We need to understand all these things. Also, that's our food pantry. And finally, um, we have a regular Zoom meeting, prayer meeting, every Thursday at 7 p.m., so we will have uh, this Thursday, uh, May 21st, 7 p.m. You need a Zoom invite. So please contact Lord of the Harvest if you want to be involved. Or contact somebody from Lord of the Harvest and, 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 and we can get your name on, on the Zoom meeting invitation for, um, for uh, a Wednesday night Bible study or Thursday night prayer meeting. Last, uh, last announcement, our next... Uh, AWE corporate prayer meeting is going to be on May 31st. That's from 6 to 7.30. And we're planning right now to have that on Zoom. Stay tuned to that as well. God bless you. Go in peace. Love and serve the Lord. Thank you so much.